بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أسرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب إسرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي As we normally do after we go through uh, a whole surah of uh, the Quran and specifically of Juzi Amma uh, we go through the life of one of the Mufassirun of the past so we've been through a few We've been through the life of Imam Al-Tabari, Imam Al-Qurtubi, we did many uh, months ago, last year in fact. Uh, we went through the last one. Who remembers what the last one was? Anybody remember? The last Mufassir we went through. Mujahid ibn Jabbar. Mujahid ibn Jabbar. So we finished Surah Al-A'la last week and uh, today inshallah we're going to be going through the life of another famous Mufassir and scholar of the Quran and this scholar was from the Tabi'een he was a student of the companions and his name is Sa'id ibn Jubair Sa'id ibn Jubair uh, a few sessions ago when we yani the sessions where we talked about lives of the scholars we talked about another Sa'id anybody know who that was? Sa'id al Musayyab. We never specifically talked about him actually. We talked about uh, Ikrima, Mawla ibn Abbas. Okay, that was the last one we did actually. It was a Mujahid. Last one was Ikrima, Mawla ibn Abbas. And we talked about Sa'id ibn Musayyab and Ikrima uh, in, that, uh, in that session, in that talk that we did. Uh, this is a different Sa'id. This is a different Sa'id. They both lived at the same time. Sa'id ibn Musayyab and this Sa'id ibn Jubair. So who was Sa'id ibn Jubair? As we said, he was a student of <coughs> the companions and the scholars praised him. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he talked about Sa'id ibn, Sa'id ibn Jubair and he said when he was killed, he said Sa'id ibn Jubair has been killed and there is none on this earth except that he is in need of his knowledge. There is none on this earth except that he is in need of the knowledge of Sa'id ibn Jubair. So this person, this individual, has a high status amongst the scholars, amongst the scholars themselves. So even the scholars themselves praise Sa'id ibn Jubair, rahimahullah. He was an imam, he was a hafiz of the Qur'an, he was a mufassir of the Qur'an, he was a shaheed, he, he was killed, he, uh, and we'll talk about what happened with him. And he was, his kunya was Abu Muhammad or Abdullah al-Asadi, Mawlahum al-Kufi. So they called him Abu, Abu Muhammad or Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah al-Asadi, Mawlahum. Now when they say Mawlahum, and that's part of his name, when they say Mawlahum, Mawlahum means that he was a slave or he came from a family of slaves. So his ancestors, okay, when they came to Arabia, they were basically... Uh, slaves and at one point or another he was freed and of course when somebody adopts someone as a slave uh, they forget or, or, or they don't know their lineage anymore so they're called Mawla, Mawlahum okay so <clears throat> he was from a long line of, of uh, slaves and he was originally from Abyssinia so he was black he was originally from Abyssinia but he uh, grew up in Arabia and he studied, as I mentioned, he was born during the leadership of Ali radiallahu an. They say around 38 Hijrah. So around 38 Hijrah, he, he was born during the leadership of Ali radiallahu an. And as I mentioned, he studied under many of the companions. His main teacher was the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made dua for, that Allah gives him understanding of the religion and gives him uh, the ability to do tafsir of the Qur'an. Ibn Abbas. So his first and his main teacher, not his first, but his main teacher was Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. So he took Quran from him. He studied the whole Quran from beginning to end with this one teacher, Ibn Abbas. And he studied tafsir from him. He studied hadith from him. He studied Arabic from him. Also he studied from other companions, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, uh, Adi ibn Hatim, Aisha radiallahu anha. Abdullah ibn Umar, Abu Huraira. So all of these companions he also studied from. And he talks about when he would learn from Ibn Abbas and his zeal for knowledge. And he said that 
I would go to Ibn Abbas and I would write in my sheets until I had filled all of my pages. So I had nothing left. This is just one session. So imagine going to someone with an exercise book, with a notepad, and you basically, your first session, you write down, you finished and you used up all your notebook. So he said, I would go and I would visit Ibn Abbas and I would study with him and I would basically fill up my pages until they were full. There was, there was no more space to write. And so what does he do now? There's no, no more space to write, there's no more pages left. He would, <coughs> he would take off his shoe and he would write on his shoe. So he would use that, okay, to make notes because there's nothing else. And then that would be filled up as well. And then he would write on his hand. So he would basically end up writing on his hand because there was no more space. Okay, so he would, and that shows his zeal for, and his enthusiasm for studying and for learning and to retain everything, to write everything down. Ibn Abbas, he said to him, when he was uh, with him for a long period of time, he said to him, Hadith nas He said, go and narrate to the people, go and teach. Okay, meaning go and answer people's questions. And so, uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, he said, you know, narrate and answer people's questions and give fatawa while you're still alive, meaning while you're still here. You know, how, how can I give, uh, you know, uh, uh, fatawa and answer people's questions while you're still alive, while you're still amongst us? You're Ibn Abbas. So Ibn Abbas, he said, isn't this a ni'mah min Allah? Isn't this a blessing from Allah? that you can narrate while I'm still watching, while I'm still here. If you're correct, then that's good. And if you make a mistake, then I will correct you and I'll teach you. And so he was given this, this blessing by Ibn Abbas to be able to teach and give fatawa, okay, and to answer people's questions while Ibn Abbas was still alive. And the same was the case with another person that we mentioned, Ikrima. Ikrimah Mawla ibn Abbas, a similar situation again uh, occurred with him. When he was younger, there was a rooster that he owned. He owned a rooster, the animal, a rooster. And the rooster, every night, it would crow in the middle of the night. And so he would wake up in the middle of the night and he would perform tahajjud prayer. So this rooster was, yani, mashallah, you know, every, it was like an alarm clock. So every night it would, it would crow and he would wake up and he would basically offer tahajjud prayer. One night, the rooster never crowed. And so he missed the tahajjud prayer. So he woke up in the morning and he said, Ma lahu, what happened to this rooster? Qata Allahu sawta. May Allah cut off his, his voice. May Allah never allow him to speak again. And so that rooster never ever made a sound ever again after this. And so his mother the mother of Sa'id ibn Jubair, she said to him, Ya Bunay, O oh son, don't ever make dua against anybody ever again. Because of the power of his dua. The fact that he made dua even against a rooster, and Allah responded to his dua. Uh, he traveled to Asbahan in Iran for a number of years uh, during Hajjaj ibn Yusuf's time. And he basically fled there because of what happened between him and uh, other individuals who uh, were on the opposing army, which we'll talk about, who were defeated by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And so they fled. So he went to Asbahan for a short number of time. But his most, uh, most of the, uh, the time and most of his time was spent in Kufa. That's where uh, he basically resided. That's where he lived. Uh, the scholars praise and talk about, and his companions, they talk about his friends and those who were around at the time. They talk and they praise his worship and his ibadah. And they say that uh, at one point in time, he was reciting at night, and the whole night he recited just one ayah. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّقْ كُلُّ نَفْسِ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْرَمُونَ the same ayah he repeated over and over and over again until the whole night passed. And fear the day when you will return back to your Lord, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everybody, everything will be raised up and they'll be held to account and nobody will be oppressed. Nobody will be oppressed. Nobody will be uh, treated unjustly. They say he cried so much during the night in prayer in Salah that his eyesight actually became weak. And when he used to pray, he used to stand for long periods of time during the night. Narrations mentioned that once he stood by the Kaaba, recited the whole Quran 
in one raka'ah. And in one raka'ah, recited the whole Qur'an. So the whole night, basically, he just completed the whole recitation of the Qur'an. And also, scholars say that he would stand in salah as if he was a stake in the ground. And he had a spear or, or a stake or a stick in the ground. Meaning still, he wouldn't move and he would be there for a long period of time. And if you saw him, you would think he was some kind of you know, a tree trunk or something that's been fixed into the ground. So that's how much khushu and you know, uh, focus he would have in the prayer itself. And if people would mistake him for something that's a permanent fixture. And again, this shows us the amount of khushu that the scholars would have. You know, and the way that they would pray, even when we talk about the companions, how attentive they would be when the messenger of Allah Sallam would actually speak. They would sit so still that a bird or a pigeon could land on their heads. Okay, and the, and the scholars as well, when they would pray, and the companions likewise, of course, that's, that's you know, where we learn, that's who we learn from. The scholars, the true scholars are those who are, they know and they also act upon what they know. So they're ulama and they're also ubad, they worship Allah at the same time. And so those scholars, they would pray, and they would pray as if they're, they're, they're firm in the ground or they're stuck in the ground that they can't move. They wouldn't move around, they wouldn't fidget, they wouldn't move their hands or turn their heads or tug at their shirts or at their clothes and things like this. So that just shows us how much khushu they would have and how much khushu Sayyid ibn Jubair would have when he would pray. Uh, he went to Kufa to teach the people and people from Kufa, they would go to Mecca where his teacher was, Ibn Abbas. And they would go to Ibn Abbas and they would ask him questions. And so he would ask them, where are you from? They would say, we're from Kufa. And so he would say, isn't Ibn Umm Dahma with you? Ibn Umm Dahma was basically Sa'id ibn Jubayr. That was another name for him. So he said, isn't he with you? Meaning, you have Sa'id ibn Jubayr there and you're coming all the way here just to ask me questions. And so again, that shows us the status of Sa'id ibn Jubayr even in the eyes of companions like Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And also the statements which have been recorded, uh, which he himself said, they say that he was someone who relied heavily on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he used to say, At-tawakkul ala Allah, jima'ul iman. That having tawakkul in Allah is something which envelops iman. It's, it's something which expresses one's iman completely. Jima'ul iman, all of iman. Tawakkul is like an expression of one's complete iman. It's a sign of one's complete iman. And also, he would make dua, and he would say in his dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka sidq tawakkul Oh Allah, I ask you for purity in my tawakkul, in my trust in you. Sidq uh, tawakkul alayka in you, wa husnu dhanni bik, and having good thoughts of you. So he would constantly make, his, make this dua. Also, what's interesting is, Whenever he was sick, whenever he was ill, if he had a fever or a headache or something like this, uh, sometimes his contemporaries would come to him and they would ask him, shall we get someone to do ruqya on you, to read on you, read Quran. And he would reject, he would refuse. He would say no. And he never had anybody do ruqya on him. Because the scholars, they say, that's how much tawakkul he had in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because he didn't believe in ruqya, Okay, obviously ruqya is something which is, you know, prescribed in, in the sharia. But he was someone who had so much tawakkul in Allah that he didn't want anybody to do ruqya on him. He wanted to have complete tawakkul and trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cure him. Also, what's interesting is there's a narration of the messenger of Allah sallam, which he himself is a part of. He's a part of the chain of narration. So he narrates this hadith. And this hadith is the hadith of the 70,000 who would enter into paradise bila hisab, without any type of account, accounting. There won't be how to account, there won't be questioned or anything. And one of the reasons why is, la yastarqoon. They won't ask others to do ruqya for them. So maybe also this was another reason why he used to you know, be very careful about not making anybody do ruqya over him. Other people who were around during his time, they said that he made Ihram, one of his contemporaries, he said he made Ihram, the intention to perform uh, Umrah, from Kufa, uh, from Kufa, he made Ihram for Umrah, and 
This is during Rajab, the month of Rajab in the Islamic calendar. And then he would make ihram again for Hajj in Dhul Qa'da. So how many months is that between Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da? Now, obviously, in those days, travel is not just a day or two. Okay, it's long. So maybe a month there, in a caravan especially, if you're traveling in a group, in a large crowd. So by, he would go in Rajab, he would travel and get there in Sha'ban, maybe Allah knows if he will stay there for Ramadan or not. And then he would come back in Shawwal or something, Allah knows best. And then he would go back in Dhul Qa'da. And this was every single year. So every single year, he would perform Hajj and he would perform an Umrah as well. Every single year. So subhanAllah, this shows us, you know, how much effort he would make. And even today, we don't go every single year. Even today, we don't go for Hajj and Umrah every single year. So it just shows us, you know, his keenness to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to visit, you know, Mecca and to visit the house of Allah azza wa jal. And he used to say, to spread all my knowledge, to spread and to give out all of my knowledge is more beloved to me than to take it with me to my grave. Meaning everything which I've learned, everything which I know is not exclusive to me. Everything which I know, everything which I've learned, I want to give it all to everybody uh, who is willing to take it. And again, this shows us the, the purity of his, his ikhlas. Meaning the, why, the reason why he's, why he's teaching is because he wants to benefit the people and ultimately, of course, benefit himself before he goes to the grave. And again, this shows us today, whenever we teach or whenever we know something, we shouldn't try to keep it to ourselves. If we know it's something which is true, if we know it's authentic, if we know people are going to benefit from it, we shouldn't be shy of teaching, teaching it to others. If it's something that we know and we, we're grounded in whatever we know. Because a person, sometimes he might think this is something, you know, unique, this is something special, this is something exclusive. I was taught this, so I'm not going to teach anybody else. Okay? But this is something that Allah blessed you with. And again, because Allah blessed you with it, also your responsibility now is to teach others and to benefit others with this knowledge that, with this knowledge that Allah blessed you with. Somebody asked him once, what's the sign of the destruction of, the, of, of, of a people? What's the sign of a people being destroyed? And he said, when their scholars leave and abandon them. Meaning, once the scholars and, and, and the knowledgeable people leave and abandon a group of people, that's when they're going to be uh, lost. That's when they're going to be destroyed. And subhanAllah, if you think about like groups like ISIS today, okay, where they don't have much knowledge, they don't have any scholars, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is doing whatever he wants to do with them. Once he wrote a letter to uh, one of his friends, and he said, uh, verily the people staying on this earth, the people who are still on this earth, those who are staying on this earth every single day is like ghanima, <clears throat> like war booty, meaning they're valuable. Why are they valuable? <clears throat> He's saying people who are on this earth, people who are still on this earth on a day-to-day -day basis, for us they're like ghanima, they're like war booty. Because it's an opportunity to what? To teach them to benefit them. So they're valuable. Just like, you know, the ghanim, the, the ghanima, the war booty is, is valuable when a person it goes into battle and there's weapons and there's other things left behind, people rush to it. Likewise, people, when they're here on the earth, for a scholar, for a teacher, this is like, this is like ghanima for that person. Also, <clears throat> another contemporary of his, and these are beautiful stories. You know, when you hear these stories, it really makes you realize uh, these people, subhanAllah, uh, there's so many lessons we can take from them. Uh, one of his companions, one of his friends, he said that we walked with him to a janaza, one of his students. He said we walked with him to a janaza prayer and the whole journey there, the whole walk there, he kept narrating to us. He kept benefiting us until we arrived. He kept narrating, advising, benefiting us until we arrived at the janaza, we sat down and he was still advising us, still teaching us. So continuous, non-stop. Until the janaza finished, they stood up and they left. And they, when they stood up and the, after the janaza, basically, they stood up and he was still talking and he was teaching them, he was benefiting them after the janaza prayer as well. So it was continuous, meaning 
Obviously, when we look at what he was saying about the importance of teaching and this, this blessing of being able to teach and giving uh, people whatever we know before we die, then it just makes sense that he would basically use most of his time just teaching and benefiting the people. Also, he said, rahimahullah, he said, if my heart left the reminder of death, I would be afraid that my heart would become corrupted. And he's not even talking about, uh, you know, iman or recitation of the Qur'an. He's saying, if my heart left what? The reminder of death. So if my heart uh, forgets death, and if I stop thinking about death, then that's the moment when I would be afraid that my heart would become corrupted. Not even the mention of, you know, uh, the remembrance of Allah, forgetting the remembrance of Allah. And before any of that, when that happens, when your heart leaves the remembrance of Allah, then you're definitely in trouble. But he's talking about leaving just simply the remembrance of death. Forgetting that you are going to die. He's saying once you forget this, once you forget that you're going to die, once this reminder leaves your heart, then you should be afraid that your heart would become corrupted. Because now what's going to happen? If you're not afraid of death anymore, that means you're beginning to have an attachment to the dunya. And if you have an attachment to the dunya, you're going to start to forget the akhirah. And if you forget the akhirah, you're going to do less good deeds and you may commit more sins. So it's like as if it's the first step to someone becoming misled or becoming misguided. Okay, when a person forgets about death in and of itself. And also another interesting thing about him, they say that he would never leave people alone who did uh, riba, who backbit in his presence. So anybody who backbit in his presence, he would tell them off, he would advise them, he would warn them, he, would, he wouldn't leave them alone. He would always say something to those individuals. And again, this is from you know, a person uh, advising others, you know, if he sees something wrong that someone's doing, advising them and telling them. Of course, depending on the circumstances and situation, you do it in the appropriate way. But again, it shows us how, you know, how, how uh, careful he was, how vigilant he was, how you know, he would always be advising people and how stern he was with regards to people committing sins around him. Because you don't want to be in the company of people who are committing sins. And how many times, subhanAllah, have we been in the company of people who are backbiting? And those are sins. And you know when people commit sins, then what happens? The shayateen, they, they contribute and they're in those gatherings. You know the famous narration of the messenger of Allah sallam, when he was with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And a, a Bedouin came and started to curse right in front of Abu Bakr, cursing Abu Bakr radiallahu an, right in, in, right in his face. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu an remained silent. And the Prophet is sitting there. And again, the Bedouin again starts to curse him again a second time. And again, he's silent. And a third time, he starts to curse, like swearing, filthy language, just the worst thing you can imagine. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the third time, he responds. As soon as he responds, the messenger of Allah sallam, stands up and leaves. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, is worried, he's thinking, he's, he's thinking, what have I done? Maybe I've upset the Prophet sallam. So he goes up to the messenger of Allah sallam, and he says, Oh messenger of Allah, why did you leave? Did I upset you? He, he said to him, the first two times when you remained silent, when you were being insulted, the angels responded for you. The angels responded for you and they replied to that individual who was cursing you. But when you opened your mouth and when you swore back and when you cast back, the angels left and shaitan took their place. Basically, you were now in the company of shaitan. And I don't like to be in the company of shaitan. So, you know, when someone does something wrong, okay, it's good to advise them because your presence should be a blessed presence, should be a good presence. Should it be like just you're the average Joe or you're just another one like them? But rather you should be there to help people, to benefit people, and to you know, raise people's uh, standards a little bit as well, Islamically. Another thing which uh, Sa'id ibn Jubayr rahimahullah would do is he had the ability to be able to interpret dreams. And there's an interesting story of uh, the Khalifa at the time, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan had a strange dream. He had a dream that he was, akramakumullah, urinating in the mihrab four times in total. And so he was confused about what this dream meant. So he asked uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, rahimahullah, 
So Sa'id ibn Jubair, he said that you are going to have four children and those four children are going to be leaders of the Muslims. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan did in fact have four children who became the leaders of the Muslim Ummah at the time. They, he had uh, Walid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he had Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, he had Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, and he had the fourth one. Anybody know? Beginning with Ya. Yeah. Yazid. Yazid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So he basically interpreted the dream correctly. Uh, another interesting thing, and this is uh, the story which some of you may have heard, and it's the story of uh, his death and what happened, why was he killed, how was he killed, what happened. So his story involves Hajjaj al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, and it's known as the fitna of al qurra fitna al qurra and this fitna is called the fitna of qurra because many of the qurra many of the fuqaha many of the scholars many of the uh, learned of that time were involved in this fitna and this fitna involved al hajjaj ibn yusuf who was the governor of one of the provinces and many of you may, may have heard of al hajjaj ibn yusuf he was someone who was an oppressor he he killed some of the companions he was someone who used to murder and you know, execute people for the smallest reasons. You know, he used to ridicule people. Uh, he was known for his for his oppression, basically. And uh, there was a group of people who revolted against Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, and they say this stemmed originally from when he went to Mecca. There was large opposition against Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, and one of the main reasons is because. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an was in Mecca and he refused to give pledge allegiance to uh, Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf or the leader at the time. And so Al Hajjaj sent an army to attack Abdullah ibn Zubayr. As a result, he you know, damaged the Kaaba and damaged uh, the Haram area and he killed people uh, in that area. And Abdullah ibn Zubayr was killed and there were other individuals who were, who were killed. Sa'id ibn Jubair and there were other people who were part of that part of that group in Mecca okay with Abdullah ibn Zubair and of course these are times of fitna these are times of trials and tribulations and so there's these things happening uh, when the uprising was put down the leader or Hajjaj the governor he entered Mecca and he forced everyone to pledge allegiance to him and one of them was who? Sa'id ibn Jubair so everyone was forced to basically pledge allegiance to Al-Hajjaj. Uh, and this is basically where it started. There was always opposition to Al-Hajjaj because of his character, because of the way he was, because of how he used to always uh, kill and execute people. And so there was this constant, uh, you know, envy or not envy, but hatred towards Al-Hajjaj. And eventually what happened was one of the, uh, the generals of Al-Hajjaj, his name was Abdurrahman ibn Al-Ash'ath. And this uh, general of Al-Hajjaj, they say he wasn't someone who got on with Al-Hajjaj anyway. And so there was always friction between them. Eventually, Abdurrahman ibn al-Ash'ath, Ash, Ash he revolted. And so he had his, his, his own army. And because he revolted against Al-Hajjaj, there were others okay, who also didn't like Al-Hajjaj because of who he was because of what he was doing. And so they joined Abdurrahman ibn Ash'ath as well. From them was who? Sa'id ibn Jubair. Also from them was Mujahid ibn Jabr that we mentioned, uh, you know, pre we mentioned it about it, talked about his life previously. Also Sa'id ibn Musayyib, yeah, who was a famous scholar as well. So there were a group of scholars who joined this army and this is why it became known as Fitna al Qurra, the Fitna of the Qurra, the learned the scholars, the Hufaz, the reciters of the Qur'an, because they were scholars of the Qur'an. Uh, so many scholars ended up joining him, and uh, when this army obviously attacked, and they met the army of Al-Hajjaj, they were defeated as well. And when they were defeated, uh, the scholars from this group, they fled to different places. And Sa'id ibn Jubair, he fled to Kufa. He went to Kufa and he stayed there. We mentioned before he went to Asbahan initially. 
So he was in Aspahan for a number of years, okay, uh, and he, he stayed there for a number of years after this happened. And then he moved and he went to Kufa. He was asked by one of his friends during Hajj because even then he was still performing Hajj and Umrah. So he would go quietly, secretly into Mecca. He would perform Hajj, he would perform Umrah, and then he would go back. Obviously, in those days, there was no passport control. You know, there was no passports. He would go in and he would just keep a low profile, perform Hajj, perform Umrah, and then go back to Kufa. So on one of his trips uh, for Hajj, one of his friends asked him, he said, how long have you been fleeing Hajjaj? How long have you been away from Hajjaj? He said, I left my wife. He said, I left and my wife was pregnant and I came back and the child had been born. Other narrations also mention that in total, and this is what Imam al-Dhahabi mentions in Sir Alam al his famous book, in total, he was fleeing from al-Hajjaj for 23 years. So 23 years, he's basically... Uh, you know, trying to keep away from Al-Hajjaj and is not living, you know, a comfortable life because of him being wanted by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Uh, eventually, because he's making trips regularly into Mecca and everyone's been told because he was a scholar to keep an eye out for him and to keep an eye out for other scholars who may be coming, eventually he was caught in Mecca. And when he was being taken back to Al-Hajjaj, there was a man who saw him and he began to cry. And so uh, Sa'id ibn Jubayr said to him, why are you crying? What's wrong? And so he said, because of what's happened to you. Because what's going to happen? Now you've been caught and Al-Hajjaj is who he is. Who knows what's, what he's going to do with you? What's going to happen to you? And so Sa'id ibn Jubayr, he said, don't cry, don't weep. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that this would happen. Allah already had knowledge of this. And then he recited the ayah, مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَن that there is nothing uh, that afflicts uh, the earth from any calamity or any, any problem or any issue and neither in your own selves, any problems in your own selves, illa fi kitab, except that it's in the book, min qabli an nabra'aha, before it becomes clear, before you, are know, before you know about it. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already declared and decreed whatever is going to take place in his book which is with him. So don't worry about whatever's happening because this is the decree, this is the decree and the fate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, he's he's someone who's going maybe to his own death. And we know now that he was his his he was executed uh, when he went to Al Hajjaj. So subhanAllah it shows us that a person should always realize whatever happens, Allah has already decreed it, and so a person shouldn't worry about what might happen because even what might happen is already been decreed by Allah. And whatever has been decreed by Allah, is it for the best or is it for the worst? It's always for the best. And so because it's always for the best, a person shouldn't worry. Because it's always going to be good, especially for the believer. He's always good in all of his problems, anything which happens to him in his life. And when they took him to Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, uh, there was a group of them that were taken to Al-Hajjaj. And of course, many had been executed before him. So Al-Hajjaj, what he would do is those who had revolted against him, he would bring them forth one by one. And so he would tell them, he would ask them. He would say to them, did you disbelieve when you revolted against me? Did you disbelieve? And of course, he's asking these types of questions because this is where he was. He would trick people. He would put people in difficult situations, difficult circumstances. There's a famous story of uh, Hajjaj meeting this old man, this Bedouin. And so he asked this Bedouin, he said, what do you think of Al-Hajjaj? And so he said, Al-Hajjaj is the worst of the worst. He's the worst of people, the scum of the earth. And he said, what do you think of uh, the, 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 the governor of this place or the leader? He said, he's also the worst of the worst. They're really bad people. And so he said to him, what if I told you I was Hajjaj? I am Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And the old man said to him, but you don't know who I am. And he said, who are you? He said, I am a man, twice a year I go crazy. This is one of those times I've gone crazy. And so Hajjaj ibn Yusuf became impressed. He saw this man's shop. And so he said, you can go, you're free. So he used to basically uh, free people who were sharp, who were witty, or who had something to offer. 
So he would put people on the spot. If they could get out of difficult situations, difficult circumstances, he would let them go. If they said some poetry, he would let them go. If they were very sharp with their statements, okay, if they were good with the way they spoke and they were eloquent, he would free them. So he was someone who would toy with people, he would play with people. And he was someone who was brutal. So this is the kind of individual we're dealing with. So people would come to him, he would put them on the spot, he would say, did you disbelieve? when you revolted and rebelled against me and against your leader. And if they said, no, we didn't disbelieve, what would he do? He'd execute them. And if they said, yes, kafarna, we disbelieved, then he would free them. No, no, he would free them. He would free them, but of course, it's on their head that they were basically saying that we disbelieved. He's letting them grow. He's letting them go, let them live with the fact that they disbelieved. Okay, so this was the way he was. So he would uh, free them, he would let them go. And of course, in this situation, in this circumstance, they know that if they say, they know that if they say, you know, no, we didn't disbelieve, that they'll be executed. So inshallah, you know, those who, who said that, they were forced to, because they had no, no option, they were forced to, they had no choice. إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنُّ بِالْإِيمَانِ Except those who were forced, they disliked, they didn't want to say it, but... Their hearts are mutma'innu bil iman. Their hearts are content with iman. So this is what he would do. So this group of uh, this this group of prisoners, they came from them was Sa'id ibn Jubair, our personality today. One of them came forward, and he said to him, uh, Hajjaj said to him, uh, "Did you disbelieve when you rebelled and revolted against me?" And the man he said, uh, "No, I didn't disbelieve." And so he executed him. He killed him. Another man came, or two men came. One was young and one was an old man. So he brought the young one and he said, Did you disbelieve when you revolted against me? And he said, Yes, I disbelieved. And he pointed to the old man. And Hajjaj, he said, when he pointed to the old man, he said, But this old man is saying that you didn't disbelieve when you revolted against me. And this old man, he himself is saying he didn't disbelieve when he revolted against me. So the old man replied, and he said, Hajjaj, why are you accusing me of saying things I never said? Wallahi, if there was anything greater than kufr, I would have said that I did it, just to be free. And so Hajjaj freed both of them. Another man came, and this is all in uh, books of history, this story. Another man came and he asked him, he said, what is your religion? What religion are you on? And so the man, he said, Ala millati Ibrahim hanifa muslima wa ma mil mushrikeen. Upon the religion of Ibrahim, the pure monotheistic religion, and he wasn't from those who committed shirk. And so he executed him. He executed him. Another man came and he said, what is your religion? Uh, what do you believe? You know, what do you, do you believe in Allah? What is your deen? Uh, what do you believe? And so he said, I am on the religion of your father. Your father. And so Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, he said, Wallahi, I know that my father was someone who used to pray in the night and used to fast. So you're free to go, you can go. So this man who was freed, he came back. And he said, this other man... When you asked him, what religion are you on? And he said, I'm on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you executed him. And then you asked me what religion I am on. And I said, I'm on the religion of your father. And you said, your father is someone who prayed and he fasted. And then you freed me when you killed that individual. This has shown me that in fact, you are probably just as bad as your father. And your father was probably just as bad as you. Because of what you said. And so what did he do? executed him as well. Yeah. So this man was, subhanAllah, he was brutal. And then came Sa'id ibn Jubair. Sa'id ibn Jubair came and Hajjaj brought him, he, he came forward and Hajjaj said to him, what is your name? And he knew who he was because Sa'id ibn Jubair, the famous scholar, the famous tabi'i, he's a tabi'i, you know, the scholars from the tabi'in. So he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Sa'id ibn Jubair. He said, no, your name is Shaqi ibn Qusair. And Shaqi ibn Qusayr, Shaqi means someone who's wretched. He said, your Shaqi ibn Qusayr, Qusayr means someone who's broken. 
Okay, opposite of kind of kind of the opposite of Jubair. Your Shaqib ibn Qusair. And so Sa'id ibn Jubair he said, My mother knows best what she named me. I mean, my mother knows better than you what, what she named me when I was born. And then there's a few narrations. One of those narrations mentions that he said, let me pray to Raka'at because I'm going to be executed now. And so Hajjad said to his guards, he said, let him pray, but let him face towards the Qibla of the Christians. And so he said, فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَا وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Wherever you face, then you'll find the face of Allah there. No matter which direction you face. And then he said to Hajjaj, I seek refuge from you like Maryam sought refuge. And so Hajjaj said, how did Maryam seek refuge? And so he said, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you if you are someone who has fear of Allah, taqiyya, if you're fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another narration mentions that uh, Hajjaj said to him, didn't I, or he says to him, uh, didn't I do lots of favors for you? I made you an, uh, the, 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 the imam of a masjid and you were, you know, the rest, of the, Arab, the rest of the imams were Arabs and you weren't someone who was an Arab and I did this for you and I did that for you. And uh, he would say, he would say yes. So he said to him, why did you do what you did then? Why did you rebel? And so he said, because I made an oath to Al-Ash'ath. I, I made an oath to him that we would fight you. And so Hajjaj became angry uh, at this as well. Also, another uh, narration mentions uh, that he said, uh, Hajjaj said to him, uh, why did you uh, rebel against me? And did you disbelieve in me? So, or did you disbelieve in Allah? Did you disbelieve in Allah when you were a disbeliever, when you rebelled against me? And so Sa'id said no. Another generation mentions, he said no. And so Hajjad said to him, choose your execution method. Choose how you're going to be killed. And he, it's a very cruel kind of method of dealing with people. Choose how you're going to die. I'll let you choose how you want to die. And so uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, he said, execution is something which you are going to do. So you choose whatever way you want to execute me, because that's in your hands. And they say that before he died, he said the kalima. Just before he died, he said the kalima. An interesting story as well uh, about his death. Uh, it said that before his death, he predicted his death. He knew he was going to die. He says himself, Sa'id ibn Jubair, he says that uh, to one of his friends, he said, I don't see except that I'm going to die uh, very soon. And so they asked him, how do you know this? He said, because me and my friends, I had two friends, we would make dua at the sweetest moment, at the most opportune moment, the best moment to make dua. And we would make dua for what? For martyrdom. That we would be shuhada. And so he said, we would make dua at, this, at, the, at the times when dua would be accepted, that Allah would give us uh, martyrdom. My two companions are dead. They've received what they made dua for and only I am still waiting. Only I am left now. So he had an idea that death was going to come to him. Another story is mentioned about this discussion between, between him and Hajjaj. And maybe some of you have heard this before. So there's another story which talks about a conversation he had with Hajjaj. And this conversation mentions that uh, Hajjaj says, I'm going to replace your dunya with fire. And Sa'id ibn Jubair, he says that fire is only a punishment of Allah. And how he asks him about the, his, uh, his belief in what he thinks about the Prophet of Allah, what he thinks about Ali radiallahu anh. He brings treasures to him. He brings gold and silver and diamonds and pearls and rubies to Sa'id ibn Jubair. And Sa'id ibn Jubair looks at these and says to him, are you trying to tempt me with all of these treasures? And he brings you know, women singing and he brings musical instruments. Okay, this whole story which is mentioned and he's basically trying to tempt him and, and toy with him. But this whole story is munkar. It's rejected. It's a false story. There's no, no answer to truth to this story. So maybe you might have heard about this story. Basically, it's a very romanticized version of Sa'id ibn Jubair's discussion with uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. 
Uh, the scholars, they talked about Sa'id ibn Jubair, and they discussed his level of knowledge compared to the other tabi'een. So they said the most knowledgeable in Quran was somebody we already talked about, Mujahid ibn Jabr. And they said the most knowledgeable with the aspect of Hajj and the rulings of Hajj was Ata. And the most knowledgeable with regards to Halal and Haram was Tawus. And the most knowledgeable with regards to divorce was Sa'id ibn Musayyab, the other Sa'id. And then they said the one who knew the most about all of these sciences put together was Sa'id ibn Jubair. So he was right at the top when it came to all of these things. Knowledge of fiqh, knowledge of the Quran, knowledge of you know, issues of marriage and divorce and halal and haram. One of the scholars, Ali al-Madini, another famous scholar, he said to his students, he said, there is no student of Ibn Abbas like Sa'id ibn Jubair. There's no one like him. No one comes close to him from the students of Ibn Abbas. And so his students, they said to him, not even Tawus, ya Shaykh. And Tawus is one of the scholars of Ibn Abbas, the students of Ibn Abbas. So he said, not even Tawus and not anybody else. I mean, nobody comes close to Sa'id ibn Jubair with regards to knowledge. And what's beautiful about this is the way Ali al-Madini replies. You know when they said, not even Tawus. He said, not even Tawus and anybody else. And this is from the hikmah of Ali al-Madini. Why did he say anybody else? Because if he had just said not even Tawus, what would have happened maybe? Somebody would have mentioned somebody else. And he would have had to answer different people about different individuals. And these are all scholars of Islam. These are all scholars in their own right. And so it's disrespectful when you have to keep saying this person is more knowledgeable than this person, this person, this person, and this person. So Ali al-Madini straight away he says, not even Tawus and not anybody else comes close to uh, Sa'id ibn Jubayr with regards to his knowledge. He died in the year 95 Hijra. And he was uh, at the age of 57 years old. And as I mentioned, the, the year itself became known as the year of, uh, or the, the fitna was called Fitna al qurra And the year became known as Aam al fuqaha the year of Fuqaha, because other scholars also were killed by Al-Hajjaj uh, in, that, in that period of time. And what's interesting as well, with regards to Sa'id ibn, Sa'id ibn, Sa'id ibn Jubair, is when he was killed by Hajjaj, when he was killed by Hajjaj, uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf killed only one more individual and then death came to him as well. So he died basically after he killed Sa'id ibn Jubair. And his scribe, the one who used to write for Al-Hajjaj, he said that when he killed, when he executed uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, I once went into his, his chambers, okay, and he didn't know that I was there. He said, I went into his chambers and I heard Sa'id ibn Jubair say, Ma liya wa Sa'id ibn Jubair. He's basically mourning and he felt bad because of what he did to Sa'id ibn Jubair. So he's saying, Maliya was Sa'id ibn Jubair. Meaning, what did I do? What have I done? What did I do to Sa'id ibn Jubair? And so the scribe, the, this servant of his, he said, I left quietly because I was afraid that maybe he might kill me if he notices me. So subhanAllah, you know, everyone's worried, everyone's scared. Another story mentions that, and Allah alam how true this is, that Sa'id ibn Jubair, when he was executed, lots of blood came out, more than usual. And so he called a doctor. Hajjaj called a doctor and said, what's happening? And so the, even the doctor said to him, if I tell you, are you going to kill me? And so he said, no, I'm not going to kill you. So he said, it seems like you've killed him and you've killed his soul as well. But Allah alam, because souls can't really be killed. And I don't know if that's uh, you know, authentic. But again, it shows us how people were so afraid of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And uh, after he passed away, uh, after Hajjaj ibn Yusuf passed away as well, it said that somebody had a dream of Hajjaj. And so they asked him, they said in, in the dream, they said to him, Oh Hajjaj, what has Allah done with you? I mean, after everything you've done, how has Allah treated you? Well, what's happening to you? So he said that verily Allah, is, Allah has killed me a death for every death. 
Every time I've killed someone, Allah is killing me once for every death. And he's given me 70 deaths for the death of Sa'id ibn Jubair. So this shows us, subhanAllah, you know, when a person harms a righteous individual, when a person harms a believer in Allah, someone who is a scholar of Islam, then there's going to be some consequences to his actions. Either in this life as a sign for those who come after, or inevitably in the Akhirah. So this is the life of Sa'id ibn Jubayr, and there's many lessons we can take from this, and of course all of you, uh, inshallah, who are listening, you'll take your own benefits and lessons from this story and practical uh, things which you can implement insha'Allah and from those things is the fact that you know an individual he remains strong steadfast when it comes to times of trials and tribulations you look at those times when companions themselves were being killed you know alhamdulillah we're not in the situation where you know this is happening to us and even in this situation people are giving up their Islam people are watering down their Islam so it's really it's, it's embarrassing in a way because of the sacrifices they made and the things they went through and they never gave up their Islam. And you have people today who are giving it up for something very small. As Allah mentions in the Quran, people are going to give their religion away for a small price, for something small. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah makes us steadfast just like Sa'id ibn Jubair rahimahullah was. Uh, any questions before we conclude? So I mean he was a Muslim. So some scholars say he did have some, some good aspects. They say, he, they say he loved the Kaaba, he loved the Quran. So he was a Muslim. But of course he was someone who was, who was an oppressor. When he was in Salah. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Fear, uh, the day when you be returned to Allah, ثُمَّ تُوَفَّ كُلُّ نَفْسِ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And then you will be raised up, ثُمَّ تُوَفَّ كُلُّ نَفْسِ مَا كَسَبَتْ Then every soul will be raised up, and they will be held to account for the actions وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they won't be oppressed. Okay, جزاكم الله خير سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد ولا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك.